you put your yeah. picture you in the picture. Your it's, no, no, no. It's, it's like Twitter. Twi video. Actually it's actually it's video. Oh, no. So we're doing yeah. it right now. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I got like three hours of sleep last night. <laughs> so we're on Meerkat right now. And I can see how many people are watching, which is zero at the moment. <laughs> but um, you got a big fall I'll, show every, I'll show everybody here. So here's Meerkat. So we see, and then people can comment down below. And if we wanted to, we could respond to the comments. Okay. Zero following. <laughs> there we can comment. People can um, can like read Meerkat it, so it'll go on their feed. <laughs> Someday it's really cool. It's great for like behind the scenes, <laughs> behind the scenes of like shows and stuff that you watch, or during conferences. <laughs> like I watched um, South by Southwest on people's meerkats. Um, I watched. Uh, That's a movie. So there's people watch. Oh, there's some. There's somebody watching right now. All right, we have a viewer. So we have two people watching. Yeah, they're on Twitter. Startup coffee. Continue the conversation <laughs> while we're meerkatting. This is Startup Coffee at <laughs> Startup Coffee at Newly. So the people that are watching are actually in the group. <laughs> well, I guess this is this segues into a potentially broader conversation that I've been finding interesting recently in the role of technology in connecting to a broader audience. So I've been having this conversation with a lot of folks who have been in the activism realm like for a long time connected with engaged with people in a very like face to face or like look at the civil rights movement how there was just a story I listened to the other day about that how like they literally would meet and like make flyers and then go door to door like handing out and engaging with people. And now it's you know you don't do that anymore to engage with the broader audience. No. So we're engaging with a broader audience. We just added two people to start up coffee via Meerkat. We have uh, Mike okay, right. so and Eric B. there's a disconnect <laughs> in like, a lot of people. Like, I personally am, have normally looked at technology and I'm like, eh, like, I don't, I'm not going to use Meerkat. Like, no offense, Eric, but like, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm like, like I don't, I, I get really distracted by it. And, but I'm also recognizing that, especially, let's just talk about maybe Facebook and Twitter, that for folks in the activism world, there is a large disconnect between a broader audience that can be met. We were having this conversation around the pipeline issue. So, like, um, we were talking about how during that whole issue, it became like a very divisive issue between the community and, you know, Penn State, and how a lot of people who were really involved in that issue felt like the broader population was really disengaged from the conversation. Um, and I think there was definitely a social media presence during that time. But like, what would have been the dynamic if there was a broader social media presence, or like, you know, what were, what were the disconnects there in connecting to a broader audience, or how they, how could they have been reached? Um, so I, I don't know. I, I'm curious to hear like how you guys have been engaging with technology, and like if you look at it as the devil, or like if you look at it as you know a useful tool. Um, or if you're like not really sure how you how you feel about it yet, like where you guys are kind of across the lines. When I was growing up, the social media was Main Street. If you wanted to talk to somebody, you just went downtown and wandered around until you ran into them. <laughs> so it was face to face. We didn't have we didn't have calendars. We didn't have cell phones. That sounds weird, Bill. It does sound weird, but you know it actually worked. People still communicate. Why? Why were they more <laughs> eventually more successful than they are now? Because we had a community, and the community stuck together. Well, what, what we have here is little digital webs that kind of hold us together that as soon as this conversation is over, everybody will be going someplace else and completely forgetting about this moment in time. Maybe, but I, it transports people too, so they can, I wasn't able to go to South by Southwest or the Apple event where they announced the iWatch or whatever it's called, Apple Watch, but there were people there and I could watch them while I was working. I got a notification, hey, someone's streaming from South by Southwest, and I was like transported to South by Southwest, and I could watch it from like yeah, first person point of view, and I could, yeah, I could comment and like engage with the video. I guess that's what separates, um, well, a service just like Meerkat or Periscope is coming out uh, from the other live streaming apps is 
I can comment and then the user. I also, um, Dave McClure is a guy at 500 Startups in like San Francisco. Um, he was driving in his car and meerkatting while he was driving. And I asked him a question, I don't even remember what it was, but I asked him a question on here, just something really generic. And um, yes. actually, I think I asked him about, what's that? He crashed his car. <laughs> yes, then he crashed. And uh, no. Um, it was a spontaneous and he kept it going. question. I asked him about, um, it was just when Twitter acquired Periscope, and I asked him if he saw Meerkat still surviving after Twitter acquired Periscope. And so, even though he was driving and watching the Meerkat stream, he saw my comment, and then he responded to it, you know, via audio. Just He just talked to me. He just responded to it. Instead he's of typing that, down the road. Yeah. <laughs> he's, a, he's in like California. It was like barely driving. He was barely moving. He was in California, I think. Well, to, you know, to Bill's point, um, if we look around, you know, it's like we're, we're sitting in actually a pretty nice spot right now in 2015, looking back just you know, since 2005, just over the last 10 years, because we've seen, you know, in this country a significant shift in. You know, our core economic model, and because you know, basically, there, you know, we had to just those were you know, avoiding uh, disparaging uh, maybe the language. You know, there was this huge blow up of sprawl that took place through the '90s into the early aughts and everything, which just popped. You know, and you know, basically post 2005, and we watched a big demographic shift in the dynamics of our core economics. The places that are thriving right now, you know, in the United States, because a lot of places are sinking bad, and the places that are thriving are the ones that have the community that Bill speaks of. The places with dense urban cores where there's a lot of face-to-face -face personal interaction. The people driving this are completely Twitter, Reddit, Facebook literate, okay? You know, they're, you know, it's like, they're the ones who are driving, you know, this economic growth, they're the ones who are driving the dynamics and, and everything. Nevertheless, they're migrating to places where they don't have to be in a car. You know? <laughs> they don't have to do this, they don't have to do that because they have everything, you know, it's like where the farmer market comes to them, you know, that sort of thing, where they can get Uber, you know, they can do this, they can do that, do it and of course they are, that is the only thing that makes sense. Why would you do it any other way? Um, and so, you know, like I said, it, this goes right to Bill's point because those are that those, that's the dynamic point, you know, that makes things work. Now there are some infrastructure challenges, <laughs> you know, they really kind of have to be looked at. You know, it's like how do you make you know high rises work, you know, in an energy constrained future if they're taller than some of the stories? Well, the answer is no. <laughs> you know, I think that's a, a good point. Though, that's a different though, conversation. With like in terms of those communities being thriving ones, but the people who are facilitating them being very yeah. tech literate. It's because I think they're utilizing technology as a tool to increase and enhance in-person communication. Yeah. It's not to replace in-person communication. And that's my concern. That I think is a, is a tricky balance, and I've seen a lot of ways where technology has has replaced in-person communication, and that's, that's when I get concerned. So like, I see, you know, if I see this being okay, a cool tool, but like now, if people people don't need to actually go to South by Southwest because they can just see it on the screen, is that then preventing a lot of interactions and experiences that can happen because it's so much easier to just pop up your computer and do it that way? And there's been a lot of things in my life that like have become easier that I don't pay for, I don't do now because of technology which is great, it's definitely made my life easier, but it's also prevented me from engaging with a lot of people in person. In some instances maybe, but it's not like, you know, I decided, eh, I'm not going to spend the money on a plane ticket and take the week off and go by South by Southwest. Right, right. I can't afford to go there. Right, right, right. <laughs> but so I got to experience it like vicarious, well, I got to experience it live, you know, live stream. And I think that's um, it's also behind the scenes kind of thing too. It's not just events, but uh, a lot of news outlets are using Meerkat to um, set up behind the scenes before the show and then maybe a different perspective during the show that you can't see on the TV stream or the you know live broadcast stream. Just a different viewpoint from it I think is cool. Even shows that um, I sometimes watch the stream of or the YouTube video of, if I'm working, I'm not watching the show or if I'm busy with something, but if I see a meerkat pop up, then I'm watching shows now that I wouldn't be watching otherwise at that time, you know what I mean? 
Yeah, and I guess, I mean, beyond your kind of my, my concern lies when, like, kids are texting their parents from upstairs in their homes, or like, you know, like those types of situations where like, beyond the different apps that exist, like the ways that we are replacing in-person communication with technology because it's that much easier. And that, that is becoming an increasing issue that a lot of academicians are looking at in yeah. terms of how that is affecting our, even our capacity to interact interpersonally. You know, one of my, my thinkings is if you take this all away, uh, New Leaf collapses into somebody's basement or apartment, the space goes away, the conversation that we're having goes away, and the question is, if you had the opportunity, would you rather be here or someplace else? In terms of buying a ticket to a conference in San Francisco, my primary reason for going to San Francisco would be to get out on the streets of San Francisco in the old haunts that I know and meet the people that I used to know there. So my intent would not would be would be for the direct interaction. But do I need that when I can find almost everything I need in the way of conversation within a 10-minute bicycle drive from where I'm sitting right now? Why should I go there when I can do it here? Do you think in some ways that though this like live streaming stuff doesn't replace but just kind of enhance like personal communication? Not in every instance, but it spreads a message out, gets new people exposed to things they wouldn't have seen otherwise? Um, at first exposure perhaps, but like if it then becomes a learned response where it's like, oh well, I don't need to go there because I can just watch it through a live stream and the person is 10 minutes down the street, then like, yeah, I think that's a, a problem and I wouldn't want it to be used in that way. And I think, you know, my point being that technology can be a tool. It's not inherently bad, but it depends on how we utilize it. Um, and I think people are utilizing it in very poor capacities right now. And I'm concerned about that continued poor utilization track. Now, there's another aspect of it too, um, and it has to do with human cognitive style. Most of this me media is visual, and only about a quarter of the human race is predominantly visual. Most of us are going to respond better when we're in a space where we can actually feel the other people, and most of us are going to respond better on listening to and translating the words, watching the body language. Uh, that goes on in a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, getting down to a text message, you are down to roughly 7% of the human communication bandwidth. So you collapse the type of conversation we have now down to a finger width. So there are real limitations to that. The other side of it is, and uh, Walter Isaacson, who wrote the Steve Jobs biography, just came out with a new book that he was working on before he did that called Innovation. And one of the things he does in there is he tracks the entire history of the digital evolution. And one of the things that I would recommend is if you think this is wonderful, you need to get in to those years between Turing and the beginning of the personal computer and find out what those pioneers were trying to do with digital technology. And what their objective was, was to augment human intelligence, not replace it. And that has become the real issue today, whether we're creating an alternative or whether we're expanding who and what we are. So I'm recommending, I'm recommending Walter Isaacson's innovation. I'm curious, like, as you're raising you know, your son, how you feel about this in terms of like, what you want to teach him about technology or like when you think is appropriate age for him to get a cell phone. He has a tablet. It's a kid's tablet. But like when he's on there, it's like nothing else exists. Yeah. Even I was thinking nine years ago when I used to work with kids, I worked with a 17 year old kid in high school and 90% of his classes, he would walk in and the teacher would Know, they'd sit down and the teacher would sit at his desk and they'd all be on computer. There was no interaction at all. Yeah. How do you learn like that when you're just sitting in front of the school for 90% of the day? And that was nine years ago. So what are the schools like now? I don't want him learning that way. Yeah. I don't think that's
don't even interact with the teacher anymore, do you? No, but even a couple weeks ago, I called a local business about signing my son up for a class, but I had some questions, and the person on the phone was just like an answering service, basically, and he said, give me your phone number and your email, and they emailed me. I had questions that I wanted to talk to a live person about, and they insisted on just sending me an email. I don't, that's not how I want to interact when I have questions about it. Fifteen years ago, I was building out a set of um, pretty high resolution video conferencing suites connecting a number of hospitals from western, from the western edge of Virginia into West Virginia for the purpose of telemedicine. Okay, um, getting the bandwidth, you know, and these are you know medical facilities. They've got money. They're willing to spend the money getting the bandwidth, you know, to run, you know, essentially like a TV signal, you know, in four kilohertz, you know, essentially just 60 miles away um, was to like the humans prohibitive, you know, and, and even so, you know, even though these folks could afford, you know, the dedicated bandwidth to do this, still had problems with it. Okay, the more folks get involved in networking, the cheaper the bandwidth becomes. You know, it's like we've got bandwidth now. I've got bandwidth at my house right now that isn't particularly good in, in the big scheme of things and everything, but it represents more than what was available to the entire internet you know, <laughs> when I got when I first got my first at sign email address 23 years ago. You know, it like, you know, went up 56k link was a high speed data, data um, You know, it's like a DS3, nobody knew those. You know, and that was, at any anyway, rate, it doesn't matter. I've got 10 times that data. And the reason why they were doing this at the time is because it made a great deal more sense in a surgical theater if you wanted somebody, you know, basically, you know, shoulder surfing you while you're cutting into somebody's brain, you know, like, now, can I get so-and-so over my shoulder? Yes, you can. Why? Because we have the technology to do it, because we can have better outcomes, you know, if we do these things. You know? And the same thing works. I've taken um, eight, I suppose, you know, graduate level courses over the last three years online through course, you know, through courses and uh, through a couple of other, you know, outfits and everything. I found the experience completely useful. You know, it's like the material we covered was good, it was in-depth, it was difficult, it was challenging, it was hard. You know, the forum support and the chat support and everything was, you know, worked for me. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not, you know, all, you know, it's like, gee, I love my internet. But, no, I embraced Marshall McClellan's, you know, Global Villages way back when. I see, you know, it's like all these technologies as, you know, a way to enhance you know, the human intellect, the human purpose, the human mission, and that sort of thing. And yeah, of course, we're creating the singularity. You know, there are those of us who will argue that, that we passed that. Um, you know, actually, it would be very hard to make the computers go away at this point. Yeah, <laughs> difficult. Very difficult. Yeah, and no, I don't um, think that's and, uh, You know, that sort of thing. And, but again, back to Bill's point and everything, yeah, I, uh, this stuff is an augmentation of, it is not a replacement of. Um, and uh, you know, I was like, man, I don't, you know, I didn't like, you know, preparatory type schools as in, you know, anything that I went through prior to going to university. Um, to me, that was all something that, you know, if I could just survive this, you know, it would be great. So, you know, I'm the wrong person to really engage on, you know, how to best educate kids, because I think that whole system needs to be scrapped. Entirely, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is that there are a lot of groups around that are really focusing on this because multinational corporations, particularly, have to put teams together that may be all over the globe, and there are people who may or may not personally meet once, but they are looking at how to create these virtual teams, and there are dynamic. You know, this is an emerging understanding of how they work. There are dynamics that are that are coming out of this that are redefining the way that you put a group of people together to work. 
And some of it is the technology. You can Skype or use visual conference forms where you can have a a face-to-face -face interaction to a degree. But what they're looking at is not so much how the technology is working, but how the human psychology is working. So they're looking at a whole new way of putting their teams together in terms of the values that they're using uh, to achieve what they're doing. Of course, the difference is that these are businesses, and they can't do it just because it's fun. If they are not effective, then they lose their jobs, their businesses go out of business, etc. So they have a they have a real powerful incentive to make these things work. So there's a lot of difference between just being involved like this and being committed to where your your future depends on how well you interact with the other people in your group, whether they're immediate or virtual. Well, like I said, there's a tremendous amount of stuff that's coming out of this that I'm finding very encouraging. What about you guys? How, is it, how have you seen it change, or what are your current feelings on the role of technology? Well, I think I just echo pretty much what everyone is saying. It's, it's an incredibly fantastic, useful tool. It can connect people that would never connect, but it's obviously not appropriate if this is what you want to accomplish. Yeah, it's just the right tool for the right job. Yeah. Well, we've increased Startup Coffee by six currently. We've got six <laughs> people watching. Six hundred percent. Oh, oh we missed you. That's like, yeah, that's, that's pretty huge. And I'm okay with just recording this because I have nothing useful to contribute anyway, so I might as well hold a camera and grow our network. Grow, there we go. Growing our <laughs> network through Meerkat. Good. Put in the pitch. Invite all these people to come down to New Leaf. I don't know where these guys are from, though. They're like <laughs> maybe out of the country. <laughs> I'm all over here. <laughs> we got Christopher, Ramon, Andre. Commercial aircraft last fall. Um, first time this millennium. You know, and because basically I gave up flying in the 80s. You know, was, there was a short period of time where I actually had to do a lot of flying. You know, but basically I gave it up because the experience is so, it, it, it's, it's just not pleasant. It's, you know, we want to go back to Switzerland. I haven't been back to Switzerland.